Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Pushing the Limits. I'm super excited to have you here with me again. Today, I have another superstar, Dr. Cam McDonald, all the way from Australia, and he is uh, one of our mentors and teachers. He is the CEO of ph360.me. So uh, if people are listening out there, you've probably heard uh, one or two episodes where we've talked about genetics and epigenetics and how to understand your genes well that's what we're going to be talking about today and Dr. Cam is an absolute uh, expert on this um, so welcome to the show Dr. Cam great to Thanks, have you Lisa. again <laughs> yeah it's great to be here it's been a long time between uh, between chats but it's there's been an awful lot of interaction between it's always been great yeah so you're a repeat offender on the show but I think it was a couple of good couple of years ago now so yep. I mean meanwhile we've dived deep into the the world of epigenetics with you and learned from you and learned a ton of stuff so about you know way overdue that we had this conversation and started to share a little bit of your knowledge and the the amazing things that we can now do with genetics and understanding how we run so everything in regards to uh, epigenetics and genetics is all about personalizing everything to your specific set of genes yep. and this has really been a game changer for us personally mm -hmm. and professionally uh, for our athletes, for people that we're working with and the corporate setting and everything, um, because <clears throat> everything should be personalized now, shouldn't it? Should we start there? I think that's a good place. Why, why is personalization key? Yeah, I just, I mean, there's a, there's a number of reasons why we definitely should be personalizing. Um, but the first is that we actually have the knowledge now that that's, that's one thing. Um, we, we have an understanding of how we can actually do this, I guess, for for our long history, and I guess for you know the history of the people that are alive, the people listening to this right now, we always know innately, well, I'm different to that person. Yeah. But then when we go to recommendations and when we go to how we go about our life, whether it be the job that we're sitting in, it's like, you have to do this job in this way. Oh, you can't do that? Great. We'll get someone else to do this job this way. Like you must do this job this way. You must go, oh, are you going to get fit? Great. You go to this gym and you do this boot camp. Everyone goes to this boot camp because that's what is going to be great for everyone because the latest science says this. And when it comes to food, it's like, you should definitely do this because this is what the average of everyone should do. And so yeah. we know it's that just... everyone's different, but then when we go to actually doing the thing, we apply the average or we apply what we think is appropriate, thinking that everybody else is the same. It's... So we have this disconnect between knowledge and action. And yeah. so why we need to, well, I guess the, what we know now is that the timing of your food, the timing of your exercise, the type of exercise or foods that you're consuming, the type of work that you're doing, uh, the types of interactions that you're having, if you don't get that right, it creates disease. If you align your body with uh, its environment, mm -hmm. then your body goes into a healing and recovery state and you get healthier. But if you misalign, and that can just be getting up at the wrong time, and we see this with shift workers all of the time, yep. the longer that they do shift work, the more likely they are to die prematurely. Wow. Uh, and this is when you That's get a scary. misalignment with the body <clears throat> and the environment, but the the really incredible thing is now it's not just that we all should avoid shift work. It's rather that some people are going to be better suited to it than others. And when it comes to every other domain of life, there's going to be something that is great for one person. Like, you know, a big Gatorade is going to be the best thing ever for a runner during their race. <laughs> for example, I mean, the best thing ever, like, and I'm not attached <laughs> to Gatorade as a brand, yeah, no. but let's say that you have some sort of electrolyte fluid as a, as a, a drink. Um, that's going to be fantastic for a marathon runner you know, 30 Ks in versus a person who's been sitting on the couch for the last six years and has a significant waist circumference and diabetes, that Disaster. drink is diabolical. And yeah. so is it the, you know, when we start thinking about personalization, we start thinking about, well, what's going to help this person align and perform? Because if you misalign, it creates disease. Yep. So that's another motivation. And then I guess, as I started, we now have the understanding of how people are different what people need to do about it. And we've got some really wonderful results on if we apply that to these individuals, they're going to get a great result for themselves. You know, this is, it's now the time that we can act on this innate knowledge that we've always had, uh, but do it in a very intelligent way. Yeah, and do it in a very structured way. Because, I mean, this is like a, a great example of this is that the whole fitness industry was really run by people with a certain type of genetic combinations. 
And so we trained, and I belonged in that group, and you belong in that that particular group. We train people like we like to train, and they're how we see benefits. Like we see benefits from the way that we trained, you know, high intensity workouts, and um, you know, getting up early and training. Well, that suits you and me, hey, eh, Doctor Cam, because we're very yeah, close on the it. on the on the epigenetics. Um, uh, wheel, if you like, uh, have similar genetic makeup. So that works for us, whereas it doesn't work for someone on the other side. So who's more of the, of the endomorph type of body. So I, you know, I've used this example before, but my husband, I used to make him get up at five or six in the morning and do a CrossFit workout when he's a what they call a diplomat in our in our terms, which means he has a different set of genetics, basically, that is not suited to getting up at that time and doing that type of workout. Both are wrong right. for him. From a from a chronological um, uh, perspective, he was should be in bed because his testosterone, his hormones are doing their thing at that time of the morning. So that was a, a problem. Number two, I had him doing a type of exercise that was wrong for his body type. His ATP doesn't replace as quickly in, in his cells. So doing back-to-back uh, sets just sends him up on a, uh, on a stress reaction. So his cortisol would be up and then it would be up for the rest of the day. And what have I done to my poor husband? I've made him actually put on weight and not get fitter and feel like crap all day. So <laughs> whereas for me, that same class that same set of exercises at that same time of the day perfect and I'm good to go and I'm really rearing to go so that just gives you a little bit of an example so today well let's let's look at chronobiology for because this is all about the timings of when to do what Um, so can you explain what the science of chronobiology is Dr. Cam and um, how it applies in this situation yeah absolutely so Chronobiology is our, how our biology interacts with time. And we know about this because we all get older. That's a chronobiological <laughs> effect is that we get older. Um, but what's really interesting as well is that uh, within, because of the sun and it showing its face every, every day or so, uh, you know, it comes along at about 6am and then leaves at about 6pm, whatever it might be, yep. because we've been living on this planet with this, uh, this big stimulant from the sky, essentially, yep. uh, our bodies have got adapted to things happening in a rhythm. And so, um, you know, it's just like we wake up and then we go to bed. We wake up and we get, that's a daily rhythm. We have a menstrual cycle that, you know, it, it's, uh, we have ovulation, we go through the, the menstrual period and that happens on a 30 day cycle. Mm-hmm. We then have, um, you know, our early life, we have our middle age and we have our later life. There's another cycle, but even a yearly cycle as well, we have the circannular cycle. Wow. And so we have seasons. So winter, it gets colder and our body does different things. And so essentially, um, just now that we understand that we've got these different patterns of time that are occurring, our body is constantly responding to cues from the outside. And so where this work first came about was um, they started looking at shift workers and started wondering why all of these people were getting so much more cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And they found that if, um, if you're waking up at night and you're getting lots of light and you're getting food at night as well, all of those things tell your body, Hey, you should be awake. And so uh, it wakes the body up, but you've got this momentum of a cycle that's coming from generations of uh, being exposed to the sun and sleeping at night and, all of our physiological systems are actually setting up for us to sleep at night and rest and recover and do a whole lot of things that definitely don't require doing heavy work or digesting food as much. Mm. And so we get this disruption. Uh, We get things happening and and things being signaled to the body that shouldn't be signaled at that time, which creates uh, irregularity in the hormones that flow through our body, our cortisol, our melatonin, our testosterone levels, uh, our adrenal levels, all of those things get shifted out of whack um, when we give ourselves an artificial time input. So we want to uh, essentially the first and foremost, the first thing that we, we gauge what time it is, is what the, what the light, what amount of light we have. How much light. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we get, when the sun comes up in the morning, it sets off this cascade of wakefulness. It takes us from dead asleep to awake in a very short period of time. There's a big hormonal, shift that occurs to make that happen and it maps into sunlight and so 
we then, um, as, we, as we go through the day, we have this homeostatic drive of the longer that I'm awake, the more I want to go to sleep. That's a, a natural thing that we have. The more that you run, the more that you want to stop is another <laughs> way of thinking about this well. Um, so we have this, as the day goes on, you get more tired. Um, we then also have uh, these uh, rhythmical changes. Essentially, it's the not the homeostatic drive for tiredness, but the circadian drive of tiredness. And you'll have peaks in your day where maybe in the afternoon you're firing. Other yeah. people are really, really tired that yeah. then wake back up at night. Some people are really energized in the morning. Um, we have all of these different things that are happening throughout the day as well. So to simplify all of this, our body is designed to uh, rouse with early morning light or rouse with light. Uh, we then are meant to essentially our body is searching for the rhythm that suits our body. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really interesting, if you take light away from somebody, and I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I will bring this all together. So if you take, take light away from somebody, a great guy did an experiment on this way back in the day. He sat mm -hmm. in a cave for uh, a couple of months Ooh. and with no changes in light at all, just exactly the same ambient light the whole time. Shoot. And what happened was his rhythm went to 24 and a half hours uh, for a daily period. So what happens is if we were to not have any sunlight input, we would run on a 24 and a half hour cycle. So, wow. and that would then put it, and he was out of sync by a few days after, after a couple, after of, a months. couple of months. He actually, and he thought it was only a month that passed. It was two months that passed because time really, I know he thought it was three months that passed. It was only a couple of months because time really slowed down. Um, and so what we know is that inside our body, we have a rhythm, Yep. but that, that gets reset every day with the sunlight. And so, and it actually keeps us on track with the hormones that are then flowing as a result of that sunlight. So sunlight is one time giver. And if we disrupt that, it creates lots of disease and that shift work. Not only does your waist circumference get bigger, the more shift work you do, all of the risks, cancer, diabetes, heart disease increases the longer wow. you do shift work. Wow. And what we see is if you disrupt a body for three days with bright light at night, they start looking like they get diabetes. Their insulin resistance changes. Instantly. Their uh, yeah, within a few days, you can start disrupting these cycles of hormones, which makes your body say, well, there's something wrong with this environment. Why am I awake at a time where I shouldn't be? Well, there must be something wrong. Therefore, yeah. I'm going to start conserving. I'm going to start going into a stressed state wow. so that I can escape and protect myself. And diabetes is just the ultimate protection, starvation protection that makes you gain weight very easily. And so after a few days, four days, you can actually start seeing some changes in metabolism if wow. you're out of sync with your sleep alone then four days to correct it so you can actually get it back on track very quickly now light isn't the only time giver um, there is also um, heat that you have in your body uh, food is also a time giver uh, exercise is also a time giver and so if you eat regularly at the same time each day your body will start falling into a rhythm of i expect food and this is what happens when you change your diet some people go from six meals a day to two let's say they're doing some fasting or something like that, they'll be really, really hungry at the times that they were eating when they're doing six meals a day for about a week. Then what wow. happens is each cell in our body has its own timekeeper as well. Um, <clears throat> wow. One of the master clocks is coming from the sunlight and then each tissue in our body has its own timekeeper. And so uh, our gut takes about a week to correct itself and then it starts getting on track with the new routine. And so then it starts setting up for the new routine. Therefore food, it gives time to the body. It actually gives the schedule. And with along with that food intake comes insulin release, hormone release, all of those types of things. But then the really important thing we need to consider is if you don't stimulate the body at the right time to get the right hormonal outflow, you start going into disease. And so if you're eating food at the wrong time, you're stimulating these hormones just as if you were not sleeping at the right time. Yeah. If you're exercising at the wrong time, let's say yeah. that some bodies are really, really well adept at uh, tolerating stress in the morning. If you exercise, that's a stress. Yep. Uh, you give your body, okay, stress is coming now. And if you do that regularly, your body's going to say, okay, stress is coming now. And it prepares itself and it deals with it quite well. But then if you take a night owl and you give them that same stress in the morning, it gives them the time of stress in the morning, but their body is not set up for stress at that time of day. And so they start trying to compensate later through weight gain. It's like I spent all of this energy at the time that I didn't want to. 
yeah. you know, I wasn't set up for it. So I'm going to have to conserve my energy because something's That's what wrong. what I was doing to the husband. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so yeah. what you see in, in a practical sense, um, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll just say one more thing as well, is that the, the mind is, is also on a clock of its own. Um, essentially, if you're exercising at the wrong time, you set off the wrong kinds of hormones and you can cre- actually create complete stasis in your health as in it doesn't get any better even though you're working really really hard or can sometimes take you backwards and we're seeing this with some diabetes now is really high intensity exercise in the morning in some studies is indicating worsened blood sugar levels at the end of the day because their body goes into survival of oh this environment's really stressful so wow where you position things in your day uh is crucial a rhythm but if that rhythm doesn't align with what your body needs in order to be in its best health then it creates dis-ease and that dis-ease obviously tracks down pathways of compensation and stress and you end up with a body that has been getting up eating five meals per day has been um uh doing their early morning exercise just like your husband yep. and because and they're putting stress out of it. in the morning they're giving them too much insulin response throughout the day because their body's just not designed to get five hits of it throughout the day some bodies are some bodies aren't yep um after 12 weeks they've gained a kilo and got a bad yep. knee and they're wondering yeah. what the hell is and going that, on and they've been the super disciplined person getting up and yep. i mean just to give you a couple of examples of this out of my life because i like mm. to put things into stories so that people yeah, actually please. get the, the the science i mean I, I you know six months ago went through this terrible uh time with my dad who was uh, unfortunately dying and passed away in July and the the six day 16 days that we were in the hospital battling for his life I was round the clock with him now my blood sugar levels went through the roof so afterwards I was I was showing like diabetic uh, levels of blood sugars uh, fasting blood sugars because I was so out of whack and so stressed alongside of it and it's t- it took me a good two to three months for me to get my body back into rhythm so that was just 16 days of sleep deprivation being up all night um hardly hardly any food in this case was actually throwing my my blood sugars up through the roof and the stress hormones that were coming out so that's a really extreme example and obviously you know that was for a specific purpose and I've I've seen this also um with ultra marathons that I've done that I've been going for days on end you would think um that a person who was exercising you know, 24 seven around the clock sort of thing for, for, well, not seven, but say two, three days that they would lose massive amounts of weight and so on. And I would actually put on weight when I did ultra marathon. So I'd typically lose it initially. And then I would have all this water gain. And then I would have this response. And within a month, I would be usually heavier than when I started, which was really frustrating. Um, So this stuff matters. And this stuff is really, really important. And I've done podcast episodes already on on uh, circadian rhythms in regards to light and why we need to you know block out blue light at night time because again it's giving us the signal to stay awake and stopping our melatonin production Um, and you know the example there with the cortisol like we want cortisol we want these stress hormones at the right times of the day so there is also a a genetic component to this and this is where what we do at ph360 and what we in in the program that we uh, run is looking at your specific genes in relation to circadian rhythms can you explain a little bit like so why is it for my husband that if he gets up at 5 a.m and does that that's not good for him whereas for my body type that's not so bad yeah sure so when we're talking about this it's um there is a genetic component and I guess what we're going to be talking about today and what we've kind of alluded to is that there's also an epigenetic component. And so when we talk about chronotypes and whether someone's an early bird, a night owl or an intermediate type or somewhere in between, because there's a full continuum of where people are, uh, this is based on not just their want to wake up, not just their, oh, I can wake up, I'd prefer to sleep in or I'd prefer to wake up early. It's not necessarily that. It's actually as to when a body can tolerate stress and how that stress should be, should be placed on them. And in, in, in our body at all times, there is a system of stress and then recovery. And it's that balance that we're trying to fluctuate through with our rhythms throughout the day. That's actually what the rhythms um, protect is that stress to recovery balance. So mm-hmm. uh, wake and then sleep and then eat and then uh, rest or like move, eat, you know, rest, all of those types of things. So we have individuals that as they're developing in the womb, they get a, uh, 
a, a heightened sensitivity to testosterone. They have a greater development of their adrenal system and their response to adrenaline. Um, and that's due to embryological epigenetic factors. And to make that simple is that there's uh, different tissues that are developing in the womb, obviously, that make up our body. Depending on the genes that you have and in the environment in the womb, you will uh, give more dominance to certain tissues. And this particular person, we're going to—they're called the activator in our PH360 mm -hmm. circle. The activators have—they develop the tissues more dominantly that are related to the muscle, the skeleton, the testosterone, the reproductive glands, adrenal glands, kidneys. And so, as they develop throughout their life, these hormones and these tissues have more dominance than the other tissues uh, yeah. and so and i'll give another example just to give a comparison in a second so if you've got a body that's more sensitive to testosterone also has a slightly stronger adrenal system yep, yep. and lisa's a perfect example of that and i'm not mm. too far from that yep um essentially what this body uh does really well is that it responds to that adrenal system very powerfully and first thing in the morning is when your adrenal system is the strongest this is when you get the biggest glucocorticoid release that's your cortisols and your adrenalines and essentially it's to say hey you were dead asleep and now you need to be awake. awake and because they've got tissues that are also ready for that um they then take that energy and if they use that their adrenal system at that time it matches their strength this is what they've grown to be strong in and so it matches their strength to be really great at this and so when they use it it aligns with what their body is looking for and then they ride that energy all the way through to the end of the day. Um, and this is because we've put the, the right body into the right, the environment, right environment at the right time. However, a diplomat, which is that the opposite side of the circle, and what we see with embryological development is on a, on a circle, opposite sides, you'll see opposite effects. And so instead of it being the adrenal system and the, um, the testosterone system that's you know, really sensitive within the body, for the other body, we actually see their digestive system and their, their neural system being more, more developed and more sensitive. And so what's happening in digestion in the morning is that it's um, essentially it's regulating where all the fluid is going to go in the body. Mm -hmm. It's uh, finishing off these really important digestive processes, clearing out the digestion, uh, making sure that the gut is rested and ready for new meals. And it's doing that right up until you know 7 a.m wow. and so this body is is having to focus all of its energy on its digestive system because that's the really important system for this body and if you then stress this body uh what happens is it goes well i was trying to put water into the right place i was trying to get my digestion on track um and, and i'm running all of all a sudden it. yeah like this does not match at all like i don't need adrenaline right now this is bad news wow. And so what happens is the body then goes into compensation. It says, oh God, well, I'm gonna to have to make up for this later. I've spent all of this fluid, I've sweat, I've used all of this energy. And so this body goes, well, I didn't get time to put my fluid away, so where is it? Okay, I'm gonna retain fluid now because, and this is exactly what happens. On if you have enough cortisol at the wrong time, yeah. then you start retaining fluid. And this is exactly what's happening. They get the adrenal burst in the morning, but if they then ride with that with some morning exercise, it becomes too much for their system. They can't then do those digestive processes. Their gut goes off, which influences their serotonin production, which makes them less happy. Wow. But what's really interesting with this kind of crowd is that the things that we'll see is an individual wakes up like that story I said before, will get up and they'll do their exercise. And what they'll notice is they start getting this, this bit of weight around, around the, middle, the middle and they'll also start accumulating fluid. They'll get a halo effect from exercise of two to three hours because their stress levels actually stay a lot higher for a lot longer right. because they're not, shouldn't be stressed at that time. So they get this um, and stress hormones make you feel alive and they make you feel awake. And so for the first three hours of the day, you're going, yeah, I'm an early bird. This is awesome. And then come <laughs> lunch, it crashes really, really hard. Wow. And you also become more diabetic in the afternoon to, for lack of a better term, inch more insulin resistant. Insulin so, resistant. Yep. Yeah. And so this individual has been working their guts out literally um, and all they've got is more fluid retention, tiredness in the afternoon, weight gain around the middle, which is the thing that they're doing exercise for. And, the, and whereas if, if they just shift that exercise later in the day when their body's ready for movement, because 
this body likes to conserve energy in the morning, make sure everything is sorted in their body and then they can move and stress and all of that sort of stuff in the afternoon. And if they do that, there's no cortisol rise to the same extent. They have much lower cortisol all day, which means they don't deposit fat around their stomach. Because cortisol um, is a real huge one yeah, for this particular on. body, absolutely. Because it's the opposite of you know the activator. The diplomat is uh, they don't like their cortisol so high. Uh, they like things to be cruisy and peaceful and steady, as opposed to high intensity and challenging, and, and, rah, rah, rah. and challenging <laughs> exactly. And so, whenever you put this this body into this thing at the wrong time, uh, you end up with this adverse effect and you start questioning yourself it's like what the hell could i be doing better you know i'm yeah. waking up i'm getting my food in i'm, I'm doing the things i'm, I'm supposed this. to yeah. do and then i'm crashing in the afternoon and all of a sudden now they're having three or four coffees which is just another stimulant of cortisol yep. um, and then they worsen the effect and so we see for this person if they just sleep in they actually start losing weight faster than if they exercise and this is a, so counterintuitive so counterintuitive but when you think that whether you put muscle or fat tissue on, it actually, it's not to do with your food or your exercise. It's got to do with the hormones that those foods and exercise stimulate. Yep. It's, you don't grow muscle from protein alone because we'll see people in hospital who are malnourished and we're feeding them lots of protein and they just Nothing's burn through it and they lose weight. What we're trying to do is we need to modify the hormones. And if we get the right rhythm to our day, Cortisol is acting, testosterone is acting at the right time. Growth hormone is acting at the right time. If we are able to match our day with our hormone release that's relevant to us, then our body is able to, any time that it gets some protein, is able to put it to work rather than burn it off in stress. And wow. so it's, it's fun. And the same thing with exercise. If you do exercise stress at the right time, you stimulate the right growth hormones. But just like in ultra marathon running, and I use this example all of the time. It's just so appropriate right now. If you run for three days, are your muscles bigger by the end of the three days? Hell no. Definitely Catabolic. Up they are, <laughs> exactly. They're broken down. So exercise is a stress and it just yep. stimulates your body to say, you need to be stronger here. So this is where um, whenever you're thinking about exercise and food, you've got to be thinking about what hormones am I modulating here and what hormones do I need right now? And that's the information that we can have. Like just as a, two very simple examples that we provided before. Yeah, and this is why this information that in the program that we do is so powerful because it gives you that specific information along with a ton of other things um, yeah. about what time to do things and when um, and, and optimizing your whole daily rhythms. But it isn't just about uh, exercise, is it? It is also about the food timings. So let's look at a little bit into the food timings and then also the, the whole neurotransmitter side of things. Like yeah. when am I going to get the best out of my brain, you know? Um, all that type of stuff as well so from a from a uh, food perspective yeah. um so uh you and i crusader i'm a crusader activator on the cusp there um means four to six meals a day is ideal for us or regular food uh my yeah. mum's guardian opposite end of the wheel again uh two to three meals yeah. a day ideal um, that doesn't mean that you and I can't no. intermittent fast either, does it, by the way? We can still do that and get the benefits of, you know, autophagy and stuff, but it's a shorter fast from what I... That's exactly uh, right. Work. Yeah. yeah, and that, that's the perfect... I was actually going to use those two examples for that, at least that's spot on. So <laughs> we've got um, so we've got activators and diplomats, which we've spoken about. We've then got the crusaders and the guardians. So crusaders are essentially... Lisa's a really good example. I'm a good example. Generally slighter, like a soccer player taller leaner slender um and what one of the features of their body is that they're very neurally driven so as opposed to adrenaline and testosterone as opposed to digestive the crusaders are very neurally driven everything is about mental focus mental drive and creation of hormones that allow you to keep driving forward and you see these types of people in triathlons and marathons and anything that requires that long-term high intensity focus mm -hmm. um, now with this body um, not prone at all to obesity. Like there's, you have to really, really, really push with bad habits to get this body to, to a level of obesity um, versus the guardian. Naturally, these are your strongest, thickest jointed, biggest muscled, and also they have the greatest capacity to store fat. So anyone that you see at powerlifting or in shot put or in uh, those power sports, uh, like the world's strongest men, 
Um, you know, Oprah is a good example of a, of a guardian. This is a body that's just more substantial. Yep. And um, so what's really interesting about these two bodies is that, and I guess the most relevant one, we can start with the guardian because it's, it's kind mm -hmm. of interesting. And then we'll come back to the crusader, which is more the, the most appropriate for general healthy guidelines than any other. Yeah, body. So we, we run the show as far yeah, as yeah, we have yeah, we've told right. everybody how to do it all wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and what's really interesting is just that our bodies are, because we're unlikely to be obese, um, just with the way our body is made up, that's not good or bad. We die from other things, by the way. We, we may not die yeah. from diabetes, we'll but we Alzheimer's. might get <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, so Parkinson's <laughs> or something, um, something not so pleasant like that. So the, um, so essentially, when, when we're feeding a guardian, they've got a body that they walk past a bakery and they smell it and they gain weight. You know, yeah. it's, it's, they have this ability of just accumulating mass at all times. They have these hormones in their body um, and they're more sensitive to prolactin and they produce more insulin. And these hormones are growth hormones. They make you grow. And so they have an abundance of these things going on. They have a slightly slower thyroid, which means that they are able to conserve weight very easily. And what's really interesting, psychologically, they're being driven to care for people. So they have mm -hmm. the most ability to conserve energy and the most ability to nurture. So you have these big, strong, protective individuals. Yep. Now, what's really interesting with their timing of food, they're recommended to have two meals per day, breakfast and lunch, and then a very, very light, if not non-existent um, uh, dinner. Now, the reason that we do that, particularly with guardians who are feeling like they're wanting to, because this, this is the body that's most prone to excess weight gain as well. Yeah. They'll be healthy and obese, but they can also really extend out past that unhealthy obese as well. Yeah. And so this is um, what happens overnight is your prolactin and your growth hormones, even insulin release, all of these things are greatest overnight. And the reason for that is, when we're sleeping is the best time for our recovery. And so all of these hormones that are associated with growth are the response to the day of spending energy. I spend all this energy, I burn, I then have to recover. Now, what's really interesting about the guardians is that um, they have like a supercharged ability to grow overnight. And both protein and carbohydrates stimulate growth in different ways and it's modulated through insulin insulin is a really great growth factor um it's one of the hormones that are involved essentially if guardians have a really big protein carbohydrate meal at night they get all of these growth factors at a time that they're about to have their biggest growth, growth of the anyway. day yeah and this is a body that all they do is grow really well. They actually have a different rhythm that's not as catabolic or it doesn't break down as easily. In fact, it's quite anabolic by nature. It grows very easily. When they get stressed, they grow. And so what we want to do is to help wow. this person rather than top up their blood sugar levels, rather than give them protein to feel full, it's actually these individuals don't get that hungry that often if they're eating the right types of foods. Essentially, what, what we see is if we can remove the proteins, carbohydrates, and even the fats at night and have a very light dinner and on that sort of uh, that time-restricted beating I say, is the yeah. way that you could think about it, but it's an early window for the day. What we do is we drop those growth hormones uh, and, and the, the growth factors, I should say. We allow the digestive system to do a whole lot more recovery overnight they'll wake up the next day feeling so much lighter, but we also haven't triggered off their key growth factors, which they already have plenty of anyway. And so all of a sudden now, instead of growing excess overnight, they're able to start just recovering other systems and processes in their body. And particularly when you're um, getting the breakfast and getting the lunch, you're creating stability in their system. Then you're just taking away their growth stimulus at night and they can start losing weight. And what's really fascinating about this, the studies that have shown this is if you can take people with diabetes, you give them six meals per day of 1400 calories, or you give them two meals per day of 1400 calories, breakfast and lunch. And what you see is uh, a one kilo weight loss for the six meals per day and a five kilo weight loss wow. for the two meals per day. Massive on the same amount of calories. Say exactly the same macros, exactly the same calories. It's just that we're changing when it's coming into the body. So these people shouldn't be doing a morning intermittent fast. They should be doing a stop at six o'clock eating 
type well, thing. Even even five even, would be appropriate. Five. But but really, it's about two meals. Um, and and if those two meals can be earlier, that's going to be better. And with with lunch is a time when we really tolerate foods very well. Our there's a lot of systems that are really supporting us. That's actually a time when the meal can be most substantial as well. And so like, this is what's really important. If we're thinking about, let's say, reversing diabetes, for example, mm-hmm. if we give someone six meals per day, it almost prevents us from doing that. Wow. Versus so you just if we, can't fix it. And, and that's why there are so many issues with so many of the dietary protocols out there because so many of the predicated on three meals and two snacks for this body. Yeah. However, for the crusader, for which us. is the opposite function, yeah. they are much more likely to lose weight than gain weight. Obviously, in your exception, it's different when you're running ultra marathons, but we're more yeah. likely to wither and lose muscle as opposed to the guarding that's more likely to accumulate and gain. And so what food has to do for a crusader is provide energy so that they don't break down because food is important for recovery. We're and it more catabolic has to, by nature. Exactly. Food is designed to provide growth to a body that would otherwise be breaking down. And so what we see, we see the need for regular three meals and two snacks throughout the day. And dinner can actually be relatively substantial because overnight you want this body to take advantage of the recovery Uh, because if they don't get enough growth, then their immune system doesn't come on and they start getting sick and they start breaking down. Whereas the, the strength of the immune system in a guardian is, is so much greater because that's the time that they, they really ramp up their growth. So yeah. we have these, uh, this neurally driven body that it's, we're not trying to protect it from diabetes and insulin problems because they don't often have them, particularly in insulin resistance, and they have a faster thyroid function. So their metabolism is burning hotter. They have all of this mental energy that is burning as well. And that requires more carbohydrates. So essentially we provide regular meals with carbohydrates to this body and their brain starts operating really, really well, that decreases their stress. And it's the decrease in stress that allows muscle growth, that allows our waste to reduce. And so by having more regular food, we actually end up with better body composition for this person. But if we have more regular food for the guardian, we actually end up with worse. So versus we have. Know. Whereas yeah. if you put two meals per day into the crusader, now all of a sudden, because they've run out of fuel, because their metabolism turns it over really quickly, they have to dip into their stress hormones to stay energized. So they have to use more cortisol and adrenaline. And what do those hormones do? They break muscle down and they put fat around your waist. And so we have this environment for a crusader, if they're having two meals, they're having to stress and push to stay awake. Now, all of a sudden, or and to stay alert and on. Um, and now we're going to have the effects of what those hormones do, which is in that body, they wither muscle and they gain body and they gain fat around their waist. And so. Um, wow. So, so they can like have the exact opposite. So, so crusaders can be overweight, but it's usually they hold it in the middle of their body around their waist, which is the most dangerous fat, that visceral yep. fat. Um, and with the guard, so this is why like some people when they get stressed lose weight and some people when they get stressed put on weight and this was like always like huh how does that work because I thought cortisol always put on fat and it does for the 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 crusader as well but it puts it on around the middle and that's because the cortisol's gone up and you haven't had enough food but okay what about um this is just a because I'm off on a tangent again, but autophagy. You know, we yeah. all hear about inhibiting mTOR, which is the one of the growth pathways. Um, and I'm always like, okay, I'm an activated crusader. I'm on the cusp there. Um, so, do I do intermittent fasting or not? Like, if I'm looking for autophagy and wanting to knock off senescent cells and and all of that sort of thing. Uh, how do I do that without, you know, triggering my body to go into a stress situation? Yeah. <clears throat> Great question. And so this is, this is what comes down to then, we spoke about the rhythms at the start of the day, like the daily rhythm, the monthly rhythm, the yearly rhythms. Um, essentially, uh, when we're looking at the rhythms of the different bodies, a crusader has quite a quick turnover rhythm. Mm-hmm. So um, whereas the guardian has a much longer slower turnover rhythm. And so what I mean by that is if, if a crusader does a day or two of intermittent fasting, 
their metabolism goes, whoa, it like really hits them because they're, they're always on the edge of their fuel supply. And so right. the, the fast hits them a lot faster, but their, their nervous system, which is the thing that's driving stress in their body, that will be impacted quite significantly if they go without food for a period of time. It'll start driving muscle loss and demineralization and to keep the body alert. And so for a crusader, it might be the, the one day per week that you do that thing just to give yourself a bit of a top up, for example, or, or to, to give yourself that, 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 that autophagy. effect of autophagy. Yeah. Whereas for a guardian, they have this ability to accumulate and their rhythms are much slower. They can actually go for extended periods of time in that intermittent fasting. It's actually quite beneficial, beneficial for them because they are more likely to build up toxins and they're more likely to conserve over time. And um, that state of a semi-fasted life is actually appropriate for them because their body generally, their rhythms are slower and steadier and they aren't affected by, by um, a lack of caloric intake or a lower caloric intake as much. So, so for us to do extended fasts as, as crusader types, um, are we putting ourselves uh, at risk then? Um, and, and, and if so, how do we get rid of, you know, because autophagy, just for those listening who don't know what the hell autophagy is, it's basically recycling where the body goes, oh, there's not enough food supply around. There's not enough nutrients because our body's sensing the nutrients that's available in our blood. And this can be low protein or low caloric intake. Um, and then starts to recycle old parts of cells or uh, knock off cells that are damaged and not doing their job properly. And this is a process that we want to have. Um, but, we, you know, as crusaders, we don't want to tip ourselves into the stressed out state where we're actually too catabolic. So, you know, because there's lots of uh, things going around about fasting and, and the, the, the benefits of fasting. And um, again, it is appropriate for one type more than another type or certain periods of time. So how would you optimize it for a crusader um, versus a guardian? Yep. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good call. So um, essentially probably the thing to state here is that it's not just food that creates this uh, like a level of stress or rest and recovery. If you were, let's say for example, that you're up on a, in a, some sort of retreat where they're doing meditations a lot of the day where you're walking in nature where it's just very very gentle surrounds and there's virtually no stress on your nervous system and you're able to completely dial out this is as a crusader um, then you're going to be able to tolerate a much lower food intake for a longer period of time because there's less requirement that's being placed on you to have food so but if you're in the middle of a busy week and you start fasting, your brain's mm -hmm. still going, well, I still want to get stuff done. And so <laughs> your brain is going, let's do this. And so in order to do that, you have to create stress hormone responses to keep your brain alight and to break muscle down, turn it into glucose that you can use in your brain for fuel. Well, we so um, it, it definitely depends on the environment that you're in as to how long you could do this. But generally what we say is if a crusader is going to be doing some sort of intermittent fasting or something like that, just doing a day per week and on a day where you can control the amount of stuff that is going on. So you're not too neurally stressed is gotcha. a really, really good way of going, yep. making sure you're meditating, deep breathing throughout the day, doing some gentle exercise, some stretching, just to really calm your nervous system. You're not having to do really big meetings and really stressful thinking sessions um, because you want to dial down the thing that's taking all of your energy and for a crusader, it's their brain. Yep. Um, and so if that's being used lots, then the body will commit its reserves to looking after the brain. So you have to turn that off in order to, to do a fast without affecting yourself too much. Because wow. if it's prolonged, you'll start continually breaking down muscle tissue to fuel your brain. And that's not good. And you release a whole lot of calcium from your bones to provide energy in your mitochondria and your, wow. and your, little, uh, your muscle tissue or like in, within your muscle fibers as well. You need calcium to make muscles contract and do yep. their thing. Um, and if you're stressed and not consuming, uh, you'll release more of that out, which is not a good thing either. No, so this is where and osteoporosis. You, you would essentially know. Mm. Um, yeah, osteoporosis is a big risk for crusaders. So mm. you would essentially know that if you're doing your semi-fast and you're starting to have to, the feeling, if you're a crusader out there, you're having to push to have your energy. Like when you're using your energy and flow, it should be just this, flow of energy that feels good to use um, when you're doing mental tasks and things like that if you've fasted for too long it'll now be this push 
It's like I have to get myself up to do this work, and that you, requires a stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you're starting to get less motivated and you're getting to the end of a job and you're just exhausted, I would say you've fasted too long because yep. your body is overextending itself. Gotcha. So, but the thing about crusaders is their bodies are quite sensitive. You'll be able to pick up on those cues a couple of days in just to see what's going on. So but that's, that's really one. important for people to understand that, again, it's not one size fits all. When you when you hear everybody talking about intermittent fasting or doing these things and autophagy and inhibiting mTOR and all those sort of things, um, it's not a one size fits all approach once again. It's it's really needs to be and in in just talking about the guardians too, like what we've been saying sounds all negative. They they you know tend to hold and I know like my mum complains bitterly when I give her this tiny little meal at night time that's full of veggies. <laughs> she doesn't and she doesn't get a big steak like I'm eating, um, and it's a pain for her uh, at times. However, her body like to see the advantages of being a guardian, like back in the caveman days. <laughs> she would have survived i'd have been long gone if, if there was a lack of food supply you know she would have carried on and, and survived her immune system is incredibly strong she yeah. uh she's is very resilient like she was in a wheelchair for 18 months and she still had massively strong muscles like it just mm. didn't she's not catabolic uh in, in that but she has a struggle with her weight and now we've we've seemed to have cracked the code on that and she's because we're doing the the, the meals at the right times most of the time and doing it uh, appropriate for her body we've had this huge weight loss over a very long period of time um yep. and and that's the way to do it that's what you want you want to sort of do that in a controlled manner um and and so they're a good and she's never going to get osteoporosis you know her bones aren't going to break mine yeah. quite likely yeah least likely to have uh alzheimer's you know even given mm -hmm. her her particular situation um <clears throat> so those are some of the benefits just for those listening out there who who, yeah. who resonate with that body type not to think it's all negative and, and we've got it yeah. all good we, we have it and all good in some that, things like the survival wise you know we would have these individuals who are much stronger than everybody else yeah. who have a focus on looking after everybody else yep they, the reason that their body is built the way it is, um, is when we go through famine as a community, their body goes into conservation. Uh, they start growing or they essentially they start growing or they start slowing down their metabolism so that they can provide food for everybody else. Yep. There's this internal, I must provide. And so their body actually assists with that and it slows down its metabolism, enables it to gain more uh, or at least stop the weight loss. So, and this is why for this body, you can actually extend the fast because they have this incredible resilience. Um, what's, what's interesting about this body is that when you, any kind of stress, mental stress and things like that, if they experience stress, they'll say, oh, like this is my, in my community mustn't be safe. If I'm stressed, I'm the most resilient and I'm the strongest. So everybody else must be almost dying. So I'm yeah. gonna start slowing my metabolism <laughs> down straight away. And as a result, they're going to take advantage of those hormones that help you grow, like the insulin resistance, the lower thyroid function. They're going to take advantage of those to be stronger for the community. Wow. And this is a really important piece for any of your uh, Kiwi listeners um, who are like, particularly Maori and Maori populations have yeah. got, and you know, uh, dominant Pacific Island generally yeah. have got this incredible capacity for protection. They're very family oriented. It's all yeah. about protection of the family. And that thing comes from the same thing that makes them big and strong. It also makes them much more tolerant of prolonged fast because their body is designed to be a faster. What's really interesting is their body was meant to accumulate during great times. And then when the fast came along, they just not eat. And as they fast, they get healthier. Like their, yeah. their blood sugars start normalizing. Whereas the crusader or the sensor that the leanest of the bodies, when they fast, they start breaking down and heading towards disease because they just lack that ability to grow and, and that ability to accumulate. So the mTOR pathways, which is all about growth, they're actually very protective for crusaders and sensors. And so we don't want to spend too long without them wow. versus a guardian uh, connectors, some connectors and diplomats, they have probably an excess of growth. And so for them, that pathway is going to be more relevant to modulate, or at least you'll be able to, um, you know, influence it for longer with less, less, with, with greater effect. And this is why we see, you know, in, in the Polynesian community, um, 
more diabetes, more cardiovascular disease, more, uh, and, th- and they also have a tendency to like those particular types of foods even more. Um, so when you see with uh, sensors is another one that we haven't got into, but that's the real ectomorph body. Uh, and crusaders have a tendency to actually want more vegetables and things that they could actually do with more <laughs> the, the, the cooked slow cooked meats and things like that yeah. um but they have a tendency to like those sort of heavier fattier more sugar rich foods when that's actually the worst thing for them and that's why we are seeing unfortunately so much diabetes so many metabolic dis- dis- uh, disorders and so on yeah well th- those foods provide a lot of safety they Mm. by having so many calories it's like well if i'm if i've got enough weight on my family is now protected and so there's this biological drive to eat foods that are very caloric so that you can have more mass because more mass equals more protection for my family but if you just go and lift really really heavy weights your body feels heavier uh your body gets the sense that it's more stable and stronger and that can actually replace they're it's a really interesting one. Ah, that that, that, that right? requirement to feel, it. yeah. So the the feeling of groundedness you get from those very heavy weights, and and we also know that Crikey. it actually creates a bit more growth hormone, a bit more recovery overnight. But it, it will direct it with the right nutrients and the right exercise to to muscle growth rather than fat. So that's why the diplomat and the guardian body types, these stronger, heavier body types, are really good at heavy weight lifting. And even though like, cause I have this argument with some of the clients that we have who are so women who are uh, uh, guardians or diplomats, I don't want to do heavy weights. I don't want to put on more muscle mass, but it, so it's, it's a, again, a counterintuitive. So they end up doing lots of cardio based stuff, yeah. um, which, you know, uh, has its benefits as well. Um, but it, it doesn't have the quickest response as say weight, a heavy weight sessions will, will do. Yeah. Is that right? That's, that's uh, exactly right. Yeah. And it's, and it's, there's a number of things that need to go on, but uh, essentially this body needs to feel heavy. There needs to be weight in the joints. Like there's a joint receptor reflex that sends signals back up to the brain to say, you are heavy enough. Therefore your family is safe. And I know it's a bit of a, it's, wow. a narrative piece, but you only need to get someone doing this. You only need to get a health type, like a guardian or a diplomat doing this type of training and understand the benefits of it. It's this. Uh, it's a very. It's a, it's a visceral thing, really, isn't it? It is. A, it, visceral yeah. is the perfect word. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking soulful, but visceral is definitely. Visceral, a, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It, it, it resonates. It for resonates them to feel with strong. their dominant hormones. Yes. Um, and then and there's yeah, like they've got yeah. these massive muscles that are yep. not designed to lift little weights, and yep. their biomechanics actually improve when they start lifting a heavier weight because the whole muscle is engaged in the way that it's supposed to. So it, it's fascinating. The, the, the form has a function and it, it, the form directs optimal function as well if you look at it appropriately. And if you put a heavy, heavy weight on your eye, we all like to rip something, a tendon yeah. or a cartilage or a, or a we bone. don't like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. We're, yeah. we're better suited to, to medium sort of weights. So still weight training, but um, not the heavy, heavy stuff. And we can do sort of back-to-back sessions as opposed to, or back-to-back sets. Whereas with my husband and my brother, when I'm doing training with them, I get into do, you know, do a set, have a rest. Do a yeah. set, have a rest, not the CrossFit style back-to-back type of training either. So, and all of these bits of the puzzle, I, you know, like getting this information helps you eliminate all the trial and error about working with your body. And so that you get the results that you want and deserve without like, I, I, cause I bet there's hundreds of people sitting out there now going banging their heads against a brick wall because they've done the wrong thing for the last 20 years. And I was one of them, like doing ultra marathons, super, super long distance for an activator crusader body type, not a good combination because I, I have more short term strength than I do uh, long distance endurance. It doesn't mean I can never do it, but it just means that I don't, I shouldn't be doing back to back ultra marathons, which is what I did. And I end up paying quite a high price with my health. Yeah. Whereas for uh, another person, that might be a perfectly fine thing to do. Probably not mm-hmm. to the extreme of stupidness that I did it because that was just really ridiculous. But, um, and so you, you start, if you, if you put your body in the right environment, get the right foods, eat at the right times of the day, work and do your mental stuff, uh, you'll, get, you'll get health. 
and you'll yeah. get optimal performance and you'll get longevity uh, all as, as a byproduct of doing this in the right. Can we just touch on now, Dr. Kim, just before we wrap up, because I know it's uh, time to wrap up, but um, the, neuro, the, the, the neurotransmitters for each different body type, and we can just go over this quickly. And I think we probably need to spend an hour just on that one, but uh, maybe we'll do that next time. But um, just as a brief overview, so you said prolactin, that's yep. the caring hormone for the guardians and nurturers. Yep. This is why these people make wonderful mothers and fathers and tribal leaders and mm. um, leaders of, of companies even um, yep. because they're that steady look after everybody type. Mm. Um, if we go to the diplomats, what are they, what's their dominant hormone or their hormone of so significance? They're, they're searching for a balance of serotonin. Mm -hmm. Serotonin is a, what you get, uh, as a reward for things being pleasurable and enjoyable or calm and steady. So let's say that you go for a run, the, the longer you run, the more serotonin you get. It's saying, hey, calm down. You've done well, you've achieved. And so when you finish exercise, the thing that's kind of keeping that calm and that pleasurable cruisiness that you feel after a, a, some sort of exercise about that's serotonin or if you do a job well. And so this body, because they're searching for doing a job well, they'll take more time to consider before they do anything because yep. they want to make sure they get the job done well. So they get their serotonin because if they don't get their serotonin, they get very exactly. demotivated. I didn't understand um, that. So, <laughs> yeah, so they start ruminating and they start thinking about things. And when people rush and they go, well, I've got to think about this again because I want to make sure I do it well. And so they'll slow down. The best example for this is kids. You've got a kid who's a bit taller, stronger kind of build, just does not do mornings well. And uh, you say, hey, let's get out of the house right now. And they're like, oh, and then they go slower. And this is because they're like, oh, well, I need to get my serotonin. I thought I was going fast. I wasn't. <laughs> so I'm going to have to rethink what I was doing. And then they reprocess the whole game again. And then, you know, they get there eventually. So serotonin is about pleasure, but it also um, moderates the speed at which people make decisions and how willing they are to take action. If you've got lots of serotonin, you'll be very optimistic. And so I'm laughing because um, this is my husband and we have this fight every day because <laughs> yeah, i'm like yeah. right let's go to the beach and do some skimboarding or surfing or something and he's like well you've just dropped it on me and mm. I, I you know like and i'm like what do you mean it's just not a very hard thing to run down the beach and do. Mm. but for him he's got to have this done and that done and this ticked off and, and yep. then you had a plan <laughs> and you're violating and the I'm plan like, now oh. you're ruining his ability to get serotonin this is a violation of his biology <laughs> that's right oh so, i have to go and apologize you do, you do, but activators, they, they often won't do. The, um, so, but then the activator, obviously they're searching for adrenaline. Yeah. And so the perfect example is they want change. They want unknown. They want excitement. They want action. And so instead of thinking about something and really planning it out, it's like, how boring is that? I know exactly what's going to happen. So I need to throw something in that wasn't planned. Otherwise, and this is, you see kids like this in school where they are sitting in the class with a monotone teacher sitting down and all they want is move and excitement. And they sit and they start making noise and they say, oh, I missed. And they start throwing airplanes around the room because it gives them adrenaline, which makes their biology feel great. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden they feel really safe um, because they're doing something that's exciting that is the opposite to the serotonin drive. And this is what's really important. And the funny thing is, as the universe would have it, you see a lot of couples that meet activated and they like are me. they are dealing with this their whole life until they realize that it's actually in their strength to work together yeah um, <laughs> and then we have um the the crusader which is dopamine so prolactin the guardian is is a selfish selflessness it's i'm going to do things for other people i've got enough so yeah. i'm going to do for others dopamine is i'm going to do for me to get the the outcome that i want and so it's it creates drive focus i've got it's going to provide energy and make you feel great towards the mission so as long as there's a mission there'll be dopamine that's going through the crusader's brain locking into their reward center and saying i must finish this and everything else just goes by the wayside people yeah. relationships other jobs all of that sort of stuff because this is the way that we're going this is what i'm being provided a reward for so this is the outcome that i want um and so this hormone makes you a little bit selfish, but you can actually, for example, Lisa's doing this podcast to influence thousands of people every month um, for their benefit, but she's doing it for herself. You know, and yep. this is the thing that we like, we, the person who cures cancer 
is doing it for like, let's say it's a crusader. They do it for themselves, but it influences positively many, many people. It's not to say selfish and selfless are good or bad. It's just the way that the biology must interact with the world in order to feel safe. And so we must do things for ourselves as a, as a crusader, but it can positively benefit many, many people. You can pick missions that are going to benefit the world. I mean, the head of PH is, uh, you know, a good yeah. ex- example, isn't it? Yeah. So just you, you, you've got a, mi- but you have a huge capacity to go on a mission and achieve incredible things and incredible amounts of things because you're so driven, but you have a tendency to bust yourself in the process and burn yeah. out and That's right. um, a lot of oxidative stress if you're on the activator side of, of lots things. Lots of inflammation, yeah, for, yeah. for the crusaders, lots yeah, for sure. Of, yeah, yeah. And so, um. And what they need is they need to turn that off uh, yeah. every now and again, just like just guardians, ne- guardians need to do things for themselves too. They need to be selfish sometimes. And if they don't, they get sick. Uh, same thing. Crusaders need to turn off and get off mission for a second every now and again. And um, relax. And this is yeah. for, so for our body types, it's really important to do the calming breathe, breath holding exercises and the Pilates and the yoga and the being in nature and doing those things that turn the brain off. Yep. Because otherwise we're just on, 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 and then you tend to wind up and then crash and then wind up and That's then right. crash. But, um, but too yeah. many of those meditative exercises and you start getting anxious that you're not getting enough done. And so it's finding that balance of <laughs> yeah. resting the mind at the best time. And, and chronobiologically between 6 and 10 p.m. is the time when your brain is going through its best recovery. And so if you use meditation at that time, it has more impact than it would at other times. And this is where chronobiology actually comes into the mind side of things too um and so then we have connectors and sensors so connectors are the most social um socially inclined health type they uh they have oxytocin which is driving their 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 response to the environment so Mm -hmm. oxytocin is the trust and connection hormone yep essentially what they'll look to do is they'll look to create trust and connection with as many people as possible and the way that they do that they actually have a very powerful visual cortex which means that when they look at somebody, they can determine their emotional state from their face. Wow. Then they have this ability to be a chameleon. They'll then match themselves to the person. And when you match a person's state, you create trust through uh, commonality in, in, wow. in resonance, essentially. And so they have this ability to immediately fall into trust with people, which gives them their oxytocin, which they get from that connection, which then makes them feel good and they can keep going. Um, the, the trouble with this, though, is... If you're trying to keep people happy all of the time, which is an important part of this, um, and you're not happy within yourself, uh, it becomes inauthentic. And so then you end up chasing little droplets of oxytocin from lots of different strangers. Um, whereas what, what we need to do is we really need to encourage um, connectors to have very strong, stable relationships like a, 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 a dog and his owner. And the, the, the animal totem for a help for the connector is the puppy. Yep. And this is because, you know, like the strength of that primary bond, what that does is it keeps a flood of oxytocin going through their body all of the time. And they're time. not chasing it in the wrong places. Exactly. And then they can go out and they can get their little top ups and keep the community together, which is an incredible strength is to yeah. keep people together and keep people connected. Not everyone can do that. Um, and they have that ability. What's really interesting, though, is if they have a bad social experience, um, oxytocin will get tagged with that negative emotion. And oh. so the next time they look to connect with somebody, it might actually be harder because they remember the bad thing that happened before. And so uh, the more positive, the more transparent and the more um, uh, like best friend relationships that they can have where they can just be themselves and be completely open and completely trusted. And that allows them to constantly associate oxytocin with the great thing and great feelings, which then allows them to express themselves best as well. So Gosh, that's um, incredible. The, the, the impact of having very honest and non-judgmental friends is going to be really, really important for a connector. Wow. Versus for a yep. sensor, sensors, uh, vasopressin dominant. Vasopressin is a, it's like a survival mechanism. It essentially helps you hold on to everything. This is the, the leanest slightest body uh they have the the smallest amount of muscle tissue and fat tissue and essentially their body is set up to i need to protect myself because i don't have the capacity the physical capacity to actually look after other people i need an environment that's nice and quiet i need a um 
Uh, I need food that's nice and warm because I don't have a whole lot of insulation. I need, um, you know, an environment that is, acid, that is yeah. warm as well because I don't have much thermoregulation, all of that sort of stuff. I need just sensory dial down. And so when you've got a body like this, they, uh, when they get stressed, the vasopressin creates uh, fluid retention at the kidneys and like, it essentially lets you hold on to all of your good stuff. It creates uh, um, essentially a little bit of jealousy, like one thing at a time. They really like monogamy in everything, like one thing at a time because I can focus on one thing at a time because that's very certain. They like certainty because lack of certainty is risky for them because they don't have much reserve in the tank. You know, if they're out in the wilderness, I need to know exactly where my food is because I've only got a day or two of survival in my body. Whereas a guardian, four weeks, you know, it's yeah. a, it's a, so as a result, their brain will be hyper aware of the environment. They'll be less trusting because they need certainty and they'll want as much information as possible. They'll want to collect as much data as possible before they trust anything. And so Connectors will just be looking for trust all of the time, everywhere with no information. Wow. Sensors will be looking for as much data, as much certainty, as much security as possible. And then they'll say, okay, this all makes logical sense. This is not a risk to me or my body. Okay, now I'm good to put some faith in, faith in this person. And so they'll be excellent data gatherers. They'll, be, uh, they'll really make sure that they understand people and they'll want conversations that ask the fifth and sixth why. Why, why, oh, why do you do that? And why yeah. do you do this? We, we asked a few senses, why is that so important to you? And they said, it's because the deeper I get, I get to understand this person's intentions and as to whether they're trustworthy or not. Um, and so they, they are really investigating and collecting to do that. And it's their brain that's, that's asking. And so very skeptical by nature. So very good at analyzing data and um, yeah. being able to, to sift through lots of, so they're very neurally focused. So you see a lot of people in uh, of this type going into say the sciences and, and mm-hmm. um, uh, so very neurally driven professions. Yes. That's right. And, and, not quite as skeptical as crusaders uh when you've got like a bit of adrenaline and testosterone and this stuff going on that's when you get skepticism Um, (laughs) when we're talking about um senses they're actually quite open but they will only do things that make sense and if they've got something that works for them right now they won't change it and i've had clients that have got a result in the first few months and then i see them four years later and they're still doing the same thing even though they have actually needed to change it and yeah and this is where they They've created security out of this information. Certainty is good. I can trust this information. Therefore, I'll continue with it. Even if my body starts not feeling great, this came from a certain place. So I'm going to trust it. Like, and then they'll you know, look for other things. So they are quite open as long as the information is provided logically, systematically, and, and compartmentalized one thing at a time because that's how their brain really works. So they need to ask a lot of whys. And this uh, of this body type, you have a lot of people that are, in, are often quite often vegan or vegetarian, um, which is actually not the greatest for their body types. Is that right? No. Well, this, this body is generally, they don't have the strongest digestion. They've got less hydrochloric acid production. They have... Um, they have uh, a greater need for minerals and a greater need for growth. Mm-hmm. And the protein is actually quite important for them in that yeah. sense, for yeah. both the minerals and the growth factors. Um, but often because they're very sensitive to the environment, the nervous system makes them very sensitive. Um, they, uh, they tend away from things that maybe have ethical issues or they don't feel so great about eating this meat. Like meat or something. From. Yeah where they get huge benefits out of doing that and eating raw raw vegan for example is can be particularly bad bad for for this individual (laughs) because they just don't have the capacity to digest all of those very tough fibers um and they need a bit more help and even it's the food is very cold and they need warmth in their body to and because the cold will actually reduce their stomach acid even further so going for warm cooked vegetables would actually be a really really great start but then edging in some protein that can provide those minerals and that extra growth amino acids really and stuff well dr cam this has been an absolutely mind-blowing episode i think uh, if you haven't come away going 
wow, I need to know what I am. Um, and, you know, if you do, then reach out to us because that's what we do. Um, Dr. Kim, thank you very much. And we're gonna, you're going to be a repeat offender again on the show uh, regularly throughout the year, covering different uh, scientific topics around the genetic side of things and epigenetics. Um, so thank you very much for, for sacrificing your time today. Really, really appreciate it. And I, I learn a lot every time I get to talk to you. So it's been a, a real privilege again to have you on. It's so good to be here again, Lisa. I'm looking forward to, to the stuff coming in the future too. 